Taubman here with 9.connects. Thank you very much for joining us here today. We're going to get started. All right, let's do that here. So you are in the right place if you're here for taming your mechanical layers. And that's what we're going to talk about here today. Before I get into it any further, um, just want to let you know that we definitely want some questions today. This is not going to necessarily take the full hour, so we'll definitely have some time for questions. Feel free to write those questions into the little region that you have with your GoToMeeting panel. I, we expect two different types of questions, and uh, some of those will probably be process questions. We know that not everybody here is necessarily an Altium user, and that's perfectly fine because we do want to talk about the process itself. So we will give that priority first. And then if there's any Altium-specific questions that I can ask, uh, answer for you, then at that point, uh, we'll go into those as well. So I just want to give that a little bit of preference. But feel free to ask those questions, because I think that the questions in this particular webinar are going to be just as fruitful uh, as the, the things I'm going to talk about here today. All right. You know, we got to take a step back. There's kind of one of these moments that you have when you start thinking about these type of things when you realize that there's something that's so obvious, it's just not obvious. And when you look at mechanical layers, there, there's something that's not necessarily, there. It's, it's very obvious, but it's not obvious. And that is that, in the grand scheme of things, very little do we ever use the mechanical layers for machine purposes. We actually use mechanical layers for human readability. It's to pass information along from us, the designer, over to those folks who are doing the fabrication and assembly. And there are some exceptions to that, but it's always interesting because we've done webinars in the past on design for manufacturing. We've also done them for, uh, we, we also did one specifically about the type of documentation you need to provide. But what's really interesting is that in the end, when you think about it, you can actually divide your documentation into machine information and human information. And the most of that human information does come from the mechanical layer. So I thought that was kind of an interesting uh, revelation. So obviously we're trying to provide instructions between us and the, and the manufacturing. But what I've also found in processes, and by the way, this is kind of interesting because I see this in a lot of processes. I, I originally started off in the ASIC world, and I saw this problem that happened in the ASIC world, and it also happens in the PCB world as well, that we pass along information from step to step to step. But there are things that we want to pass along which we don't necessarily know where to put. And so really we're kind of blessed that we have these mechanical layers because that's the kind of stuff that we need to pass along. Because if we don't pass it along, then we make assumptions. Or the people who are doing the fabrication could be making assumptions. And that's where we're going to have some problems. Now, um, the other thing that we're going to see here, and I'm going to give you a couple of examples of it, is that there are just certain things we just can't really describe in the machine language, or we haven't gotten to that point to make that uh, readily uh, easily done in our tools. And I'll give you a great example. Uh, I'll talk about back drilling here for just a moment. This is becoming more and more popular, especially with those people who are doing high-speed design. And interestingly enough, Altium only just addressed this in Altium Designer 17. So you can see how new it is for them to address it. And in looking at other tools, they're still trying to address it as we speak. So here's a situation where you may want to do something called a back drill, and I'll explain what a back drill is in just a moment just because you might be curious about it. But here's something about a back drill that you'd want the machine information to be automatically included, but for a lot of tools, they just haven't gotten to that yet. So this is a great example where you might use a mechanical layer because you would actually have to provide something like uh, the location of the back drill, okay, where you're going to hit this thing, the size of the drill that you're going to use to basically uh, uh, take out all the copper here, and then are you going to hit it from the top or are you going to hit it from the bottom? And then what layer are you going to hit it all the way to? So these are the things that you would actually have to write out on a mechanical layer if you actually wanted to do a back drill, but you don't know how to put that in a machine language, for example. So what is a back drill, by the way, is just as a side note. Uh, it's becoming a little bit more popular, and I can see some other advantages to this as well. In high-speed design, you don't want to have what they call a stub. So if you're going, for example, from layer one to layer three over here and you're doing a through-hole design, you don't want to leave the stub in here because if you're familiar with high-speed stuff, you leave a stub in there, you're going to get a reflection, and reflections are not good things. So what they do is they say, all right, we're going to just allow this thing to go through the complete fabrication process, and then afterwards, when we're done with this, we're going to actually just take a larger drill and drill out all the extra copper, and then we're just going to leave this hole in there, and at that point, you've reduced the stub and hopefully to almost nothing. 
So this is becoming really popular, and it also dawned on me when I was looking up more information about back drills, just to give this example, it's kind of a neat thing because if you're familiar with blind and buried vias, for example, you've got to be very strategic about those layers that you're going to use those on, otherwise you might make it very difficult to manufacture. But what's kind of neat about a back drill, and I haven't looked into all of the financial aspects of it, but at least from a design aspect, it's kind of neat because what the back drill allows you to do is the freedom to use a through-hole via and you can go from any layer that you want, right? And then later on, just let the fabricator say well, to remove the rest of the stub. But going back to what our whole purpose of this, this uh, presentation is, is that if we can't put this in a machine format, we've got to explain it somehow, and that's what the mechanical layers are providing us. Okay. So I do have a quick polling question for you. This is one of the questions that came up uh, when I was kind of thinking about this. Do, um, do you have a company standard for your mechanical layers? And I'd just like to know if you guys have already contemplated this and if you're using it or if it's something that's uh, somewhat new to you or you just decided to finally um, uh, address it. So we can put that poll up here right now. I think everybody has voted at this point in time, so I'll just show the poll results here. So hopefully everybody can see those over here. If not, I'll, I will read those out. 44% uh, say that no, everybody's on their own. and That's, uh, that's kind of what we expected. 10% it's documented but not allowed. 37% uh, said it is documented and followed. So it's only about one-third of, of you guys out there who not only have it documented, but are following it as well. And there's even 10% of you who's like, well, really up to now, I've never really cared about them, but figured may as well uh, find out what uh, you might be able to do with them. So uh, some interesting statistics there, definitely. All right. So what I'm going to do over here is I'm going to continue along here, and let's show you a little bit more about uh, mechanical layers. We've mentioned this before, but it's always worth saying, unfortunately, there's no standard. There's no IPC standard. There's no IEEE standard to it. And to be quite honest with you, that's probably a good thing because every company has different needs. Like, for example, in the prior slide here, if you're not doing high-speed design, then you probably don't care about possibly having a mechanical layer for, uh, for back drilling. But here's another example. There are some companies out there who have to do conformal coating. So if you're not familiar with conformal coating, for example, they put this on there to assist with what they call shock and vibe. And that's in any type of equipment that's going to have a lot of vibration or it's going to be put in harsh environments, primarily in automotive or mill aero uh, in the airline industry. These are the kind of things that they would actually spray that on. But if you're making something that's really more for the consumer environment, you probably would never have to bother with it. So here's an example of a mechanical layer that people who are doing conformal coding would certainly like to have so they can, uh, so that they can provide information to the, uh, actually it goes to the assembler at this point because it's a post process after everything has been placed on it to tell them where they want to have it sprayed, if there's areas that they need to avoid or to basically mask out, uh, or what type of material that they want to have sprayed on there because there's a number of different polymers that they can use uh, for conformal coding. Another example here is that some people may actually use glue dots. And glue dots could be used if, for example, you're using a, a very, uh, it's a relatively new type of package. Uh, they have some major benefits to them, but unfortunately they roll as well. So if you're using a certain type of package or you're doing a lot of mixing between surface mount components and uh, through hole components, you may want to consider to have a mechanical layer for glue dots. So you can see again that mechanical layers are really to the um, the eye of the designer. Do we need to have this? Is this something that we need to express to either the fabricator or the assembler? Okay. What I have found in the end, and I will show you some examples here of a mechanical layer set that we've come up together, but what I really want to emphasize to you at the very beginning of this all is that there needs to be consistency. Okay. If you have sat on prior webinars we've talked about in the past, I've talked about, let's say, the schematic symbols. And in schematic symbols, for example, what did we tell you about that? We said there had to be consistency. There has to be consistency, especially when it comes to names, because if you don't have the right names, for example, you're going to have different columns when you try to do a bill of materials. And even if you have a consistent name, if you don't have a consistent format for your value, then it's going to be very difficult to store. So there's this whole thing about consistency, and that's very true about mechanical layers as well. Uh, it should, in, if you talk, if you remember any, or you attended our webinar when we talked about the footprints, for example, mechanical layers had to have consistency to them. So when it comes to mechanical layers in general, within the company, there definitely needs to be a standard as to what that standard is going to be. That's up to everybody.
who has a stake in it. But after that standard's been established, everyone's got to follow it, or it's going to be, uh, it, it's really going to be a mess at that point. Now, it's easy to preach. And I want to give you an example of how, um, how I kind of even got burned by it a little bit and what even brought this whole idea about. So, and it did take me three hours to actually correct this because of a, a little bit of a snafu on my end of it. Uh, just to give a little bit of a story, how do we get into this whole thing to begin with? We happen to have a customer who came to us and said, we want you to translate about uh, eight, 10 different projects. They were all small projects, but they came from other tools and they came from other companies that had been acquired by them. Nobody remember who really designed a lot of these things, and we had to work through the various documentation uh, to make sure that we could recreate these things in Altium Designer. Okay, so the big thing that they asked us for again was consistency. So they said, "Well, everybody did it in their own way, but let's come up with a consistent way of presenting our documentation." So as a part of this, we definitely had to make sure that we came up with a set of uh, with a set of mechanical layers that were going to satisfy their needs. Now, the list I'm showing here is not theirs. It's a, similar to it, but I rearranged it afterwards because after we went through this exercise, I said, this is great, and this is stuff I want to show everybody, and let me apply it to our own project here at 9.connects. So the project I'm going to show you is something called the Range Finder, and it's something we use for our PCB Foundations class because our Foundations class is all about processes. And we figured, well, we can't preach to the... We can't preach in, in, to everybody about using these things if we don't actually have a real design. And so that's what we put together. However, this design already existed. So as a result of that, I went in there uh, from my knowledge from this past experience with this customer, rearranged the mechanical layers, put them all in the PCB design, and then went over to the layout or the, uh, the library at that point in time and realized that, they, that my colleagues who had been working on this had come up with a completely different set of layers. Okay, so that required me to go in there and carefully change out the layers so that everything uh, conformed with each other. And what was interesting about this, just as a side note, is that what happened here was that I was working from the translation side. I was working on the PCB side, not worrying about libraries because we didn't have libraries to import. And what we were doing is creating the libraries from our PCBs, as opposed to my colleagues' focus, which is the design side where they're taking libraries and creating a design into the PCB. So just just be uh, kind of aware of this consistency. Probably where you're coming from is that you're probably more coming from the design side. So make sure that you start off with your libraries first. Understand how those have been set up. And if they're not set up properly with the mechanical layers, put the time and energy into it because they will impact the mechanical layers that you're ultimately going to be working with on the layout side there. So that was kind of the, the story that I learned here. And hopefully um, it's something that you guys can take away from this. This is all I really want to show you on the slide side. Let's get into some. Um, let's get into the mechanical layers themselves. So, what I've done over here is taken our rangefinder board here and added in some layers, and I've also grouped them as well. And I'll talk about grouping here in just a moment. But in order to do any type of grouping or any type of organization of our layers, we need to have a set of layers. So let me hit the L key here, jump on this here, and let's do that again. And we'll bring that up over here. And let's focus in on the mechanical layers. So this list that I'm putting forth is something that you can take, you can add to it, you can remove from it. You may see things in there that are a little bit unusual. There are ones in there that you'd probably think you'd never use, and that's perfectly fine. And that's the point I want to drive across over here is that, yes, when you come to these things, there are ones that you probably more than likely want to have. But there are going to be ones uh, that... Uh, we were presenting that you probably wouldn't want to bother with. So let me talk about a couple of the things here, uh, more of the mechanics of it. First and foremost, notice the naming convention that we've used here. So we've used basically kind of a call a three-field naming convention, where the prefix first and foremost starts off with the number, and the mechanical layer number. Because we have to remember something about these mechanical layers. By default, the system architecture is going to stick with whatever was originally given to that name. So these names that we give are just for human readability purposes, right? So for example, M04, where it says PCB outline only, that's so that I know what's supposed to be on there, or whoever reads this knows what's on there. But for the computer architecture, they're just interested in what the original name is, which is mechanical four. So by having this number here as the prefix, uh, first and foremost, the order is almost always going to be retained to the original name, but more importantly, it allows me to have, I'll say, a link between what my name is 
and what the actual layer is being declared as. So that's why I recommend to always have this as the prefix. And it just makes it very easy to find things in the list as well. You'll notice also that I use an underscore. And I'm just going to go on a, maybe a little bit of a tangent about this. Um, I call this the attack of the meta characters when you're not careful. And I do come from a programming background as well. When you start using special characters like dashes or you use white spaces, for the most part, these tools have been built so that they can handle that just fine. But what I'd caution you on is that we have to remind ourselves that these tools were not written in one day by one person. They've been written over time by many individuals who write different functions uh, for these tools. And sometimes what happens is they don't build that particular function uh, with, a, um, with the intention of handling special characters very well. So maybe, uh, for example, you use an asterisk in there or you used uh, a dash in there. And sometimes those things have a certain meaning. Uh, depending on the operating system or depending on the program. Uh, and it can be misinterpreted, and as a result, it may do some unusual things. Now, I bring this up because when I used to do support at Altium, I used to actually have a list which I called the attack of the meta characters. So when someone would call up and they said, look, I've been using this tool for years, and now all of a sudden this particular project is just not working right for me, but all my other projects have worked fine, more often than not, it would happen to be something that they put in the names. So I'm, I'm always of the opinion and impression to, if you're going to come up with these names over here, you may just simply want to keep to the programmer's convention, which is always alphanumerics and an underscore if you want to just provide a little bit of separation for the ease of reading it. The other thought that I have with this, too, is that also keep in mind that a lot of times this data, even if it works perfectly fine in your EDA tool, is going to get pushed over to other tools on the fabrication of the assembly side as well. And hopefully they've built their stuff and have made it robust as well. But you're chanting it when you start throwing in other meta characters. And by the way, I guess I should define meta characters as anything that's non-alphanumeric. So for any of those uh, symbols that you have to hold down the shift key that happen to be above, above your number line are considered to be meta, meta characters. So uh, that's why uh, I'm very keen on always using the underscore here. In the programming, in, in, for programmers, basically, they've always used underscores as kind of the um, visible white space, if you want to call it that and it works just fine. So that's, uh, that's kind of my little tangent about um, when you're coming up with naming conventions, be careful about using these characters that um, are, not, are non alphanumeric. The middle, uh, we'll call it the, the middle part of these names is simply nothing more than a good description. So you want to come up with a description that everybody can read. It doesn't have to be super long. As a matter of fact, when it comes to MO8 or MO9, I probably could have gotten away with uh, comp mech. But you know, I just spelled it out there, and it's perfectly fine. I can read it. And of course, the last one, if there's a view that we need to put it in, uh, so we have a top and a bottom as well. Some of them do need it. Some of them don't. And it's just a matter if, if they do need it to make sure that you spell that out there. So it's really easy to read this. Now, what about the me mechanical layers themselves? You've probably seen some in here that don't make a whole lot of sense to you. Some of them you'd be a little bit surprised about. Uh, two of them I can think of off the top of my head, first and foremost, is like the bill of materials. So do you need to put the bill of materials in there? Absolutely not. Uh, it was interesting. Our customers asked for it, and it made, it made sense for them because their boards were actually very small. And so I was trying to figure out, well, what point does it make sense to put a bill of materials in there, and what point does it not? If you've got a really small board and it's got less than, let's say, two, different, probably two dozen different types of components, that's easy enough to throw into the design. You just copy and paste it and throw it in. And it just helps the readability of the design. If you've got a massive project where you're well over two dozen of them, probably don't need it at that point because now you're probably dealing with the PLM and a whole purchasing system in order to handle that type of volume of, of, of components. The other one that may surprise you a little bit is that you see like the silk top and the silk bottom. And you may say to yourself, well, I already have a silk top overlay. Why would I bother using a mechanical layer for this? Because you've got to remember something that the silk top or the, let's say the, the special layer or the dedicated layer for the silk is not one I want to trifle with. That one is the one that's going to get fed into a machine. So if I want to add additional notes to it, I've now got this mechanical layer that I can use. So I can put all those additional notes on there without actually impacting that layer itself. So again, just a readability issue. So these are the type of things that we put on there. Again, if, you, if you're interested in the list, we, I'll tell you where you can get this list afterwards and you can make make up your own decisions as to which ones you may want to keep or rearrange the order to your liking, and so on and so forth. The other thing you may have noticed is the color scheme here. And I think it's kind of interesting, and I've had to put a lot of thought into this, but 
we seem to, we try to make this huge effort to try to provide a different color for every single layer. And I think we see that in all the designs and exercises. But if we start grouping things, and again, I'll talk about grouping here in just a moment, the, you don't really need to do that. Okay? Um, really the key thing that I find with colors is contrast. And the best, obviously, contrast that you can really have is a black background uh, with white lettering on it because that's the perfect contrast. And as a matter of fact, you can, you'll can you notice that MO1, MO3, 5, 6, and 7, they're all the same color. They're white. Because I figured that, you know what, I can tell the difference between what's a note and what's a stack up and what's a part of the template. So I really don't need to provide it all these different colors. So that, that was my rationale on all of this here. Now, you'll also notice that we have a border template. So you can, you can see that over here within the screen itself. And that one is in white. But I purposely gave the bottom template, the reverse of it, um, a very different color, so I knew that if I was working on the bottom uh, or viewing it from the bottom, uh, that I was definitely using that particular template. So that was why I picked these two uh, these two colors as such. But you'll notice that for what I'll call those mechanical layers that are not of textural data but of graphical data, I just simply said, okay, anything that's on the bottom is going to be this orange, and anything that's going to be on the top is going to be this light blue, and uh, and that's what we've got over here. So this kind of gives you an overview of the mechanical layers, but let's see them now kind of in operation. So what a lot of us tend to do, and I've been doing this a lot too, and it's kind of silly for me for the all this time that I've spent in, in looking at these things, more often not what we do is we try to fish through, we try to find those things that we have, and sometimes for us, if you're familiar with Altium, we'll go into what's called single layer mode, which is a shift S, and then we'll try to find things that way as well, and we'll do things like that, or other times we'll hit our L key, and we'll dump, jump in here and we'll enable and disable things, so we can try to make heads or tails of the views that we've got. Well, interestingly enough, there's a feature in the tool that's always been there, and I've known about it, but I never put two and two together. And uh, it's not until we actually started doing this project with this particular customer. So I do want to throw up our next poll question here. And the next poll question is this, is basically, have you used, have you grouped your mechanical layers together? Okay. And I'm curious to see if you guys have have made use of this. All right. I think everybody at this point who's going to vote has voted in. So really, two, two thirds of you have not used this. So you're probably using the same method that I'm using in order to uh, get around our mechanical layers. Uh, or you're just not using the mechanical layers at all. But there's actually a really neat feature in Altium Designer and probably in any other EDA tool that's out there that's worth its weight that you can group these things. So where I'm going to go with this here in this particular example is I'm going to go down to this thing called LS, which is called Manage Layer Sets. And what you're going to notice over here is there's some defaults over here. So if I want to look at all the mechanical layers, I could just turn those on. And what it does is instead of me going through and manually turning these things on and off, you can see that these things have been turned off, and now I just see the mechanical layers, I can set these up so I just go into this list, click on what I want to see, and it will turn those things on and off for me. And what we did with the customer, and this was just the brilliant aspect of it, was that what we did with these mechanical layers is we grouped them together to form a story for something in particular. So let's look at, for example, the notes page. So when I clicked on this, what we were able to do is take the information from these five different layers to put together our notes. So what do we have in here? Well, we've got a top and bottom layer, which aren't even mechanical layers. They actually are copper layers. We figured we'd throw those in here since you know, it just adds to the, uh, to the notes and representation of the board itself. But even if we didn't have this in here, we have the border template. Okay? We've got our notes, which are over here. And then we also have something called the PCB outline only. And let me talk about that for just a moment. As I mentioned earlier, what's really interesting about mechanical layers, as you're seeing here in this example, and I think we're driving home this point, they're for human readability purposes. Now, more often than not, we just throw everything through the Gerber set. Right, or it, ODB++, whatever we've got for layers, we just tell the tool, take every one of my layers, regardless of what it is, and put it into the, into the fabrication format. But it may surprise you to know that very few of those layers ever actually make it into the machinery. But one of the layers that they've always asked for is this one that's called uh, the outline only. And the reason why it's the outline only is because that's all they want on it is the outline. They don't want any more information on it. They don't want any notes. They don't want any dimensions. They don't want any template aspect of it. They just simply want a layer that shows the outline because they can take those accurate coordinates and use that in their system. 
And so that, that's probably the only exception to it. But the rest of this stuff is just for us, for our, you know, for our visual reading of this over here. Also notice one thing about the mechanical layers. Not one mechanical layer does it all. It's all these separate ones that are brought together, overlaid on each other, that provides us what we see here. So if I went into the single layer mode here again, you know, here's the top layer. Well, that doesn't tell me much. The bottom layer doesn't tell me much. The template's nice, but it tells me nothing. The notes are okay, but you know, it, it's it's void of any other information other than uh, just simply the fabrication notes. And of course, the board outline here doesn't tell me much as well. But when we put these all together, it tells me a whole story. And you can see this with any of the other ones. Let's go to the silk one, for example. Uh, so for the silk top over here. So here's the silk overlay. So as I mentioned earlier on, I don't want to mess with the overlay itself because that's what is going to get uh, fed into the uh, into the machinery when they do the uh, when they do the inking of it. Excuse me. <clears throat> but I also have my outline turned on. I also have my border template on. And if I wanted to put any notes outside of the uh, outside of these this overlay, I can certainly do it. As a matter of fact, we made it uh, we made it light blue over here. So if I wanted to say, hey use a certain color on this or hey if you got a smudge and it's not over the over any of the copper I'll accept the board so you can put notes in there as well and it'll have no impact on the top overlay so how do we do this real well, very quickly and again this is specific to Altium but I've got to believe any EDA tool out there will do something very similar to it we click on board layer sets here we create a new set okay just click on this and I'll just make it empty just to give an example and once you've got this, you give it a name, and you just turn on whatever layer there are that exists in the board. And you can see that all these layers are pretty much every layer you've got turned on or available is going to be um, available to you so that you can turn those on and off. The only other thing I wanted to show you over here is, uh, and this happens to happen to be with Altium. I'm not sure how other tools will do this. But when you start viewing things from the bottom side, it gets kind of interesting. Because then the question comes, do I want to view the bottom through the top, or do I want to flip it over and view it from there? So you get what they call the mirroring of the mirroring. So I'm going to turn this off over here on number three, and then you can see what this looks like or where I'm going with this. So if we're dealing with the bottom layer, what do we need to do here? Well, I'm going to go over here to LS, and now that I've turned off my bottom layer here, let's take a look at um, the, uh, the solder side, what they call the bottom side here. Okay. So what I did was actually I take the template, and when I copied it from 01 into 02, I flipped it to the back side. Okay? So this is what it would look like. I'm still looking through the top over here, but you're saying, okay, you're looking through the top, but you flip this over. So why is that? Because what I want effectively is the mirror of the mirror. So when I go back into LS, for example, and I go to my board sets, and I go over to um, my solder side here, and I say I want to view from the bottom side. Right? And I'm going to close this now. It's turned on. I'm going to refresh it by just clicking on it again. Okay. Now, really, what I see is the true bottom side, but I can also read my template over here. So that's why I call it the mirror of the mirror. But the default in order, in order for me to bring this in was actually I had to flip it to its backside. So um, Altium gives me some flexibility uh, on this particular thing. Again, I don't know if other tools have this. i got to believe any of the Tier 1 tools would certainly do something like this. But that's how you, you handle this. And that's really how you can put together all your documentation, because how you set up all this documentation over here is effectively the same way you'd set up your documentation for your PDFs. Right? And, uh, and you can click on these and go about as you see fit. And for those people, let's say, for example, that they have a viewer, and they're not going to do any modifications to this, but they want to see the design and review it, this is really something that's great to pass along to them, because as long as they know about this, they can look at whatever you've got set up over here. So if they want to see what the drill information is, it's there. They want to see assembly top, you know, it's there. Uh, it's, it's all put in, in some order so that it's quick and easy to find, and you're not playing this crazy game of constantly going in here and changing your configurations up, which, again, I've been doing for the last decade. So when I had my epiphany on this, I said, i got to show everybody else this, because I tend to believe I'm not the only one who's probably going crazy turning on and off mechanical layers at this point. So that's what I wanted to show you. I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. It's not that hard of a concept. It just takes a bit of time to do these things. Okay? And that, yes, it will take you some time to figure out which mechanical layers you want. It's going to take you some time to figure out the order. It's going to take you some time to determine whether or not you're, you've already got something set up in your, uh, your footprints first. So work with your footprints first and then figure out 
which, uh, which layers you want to keep in those so you don't have to rearrange those later on, right, because that's going to be a bit of a hassle. So work with the ones that you may have already established for your footprints if you have them already established, and then figure out which ones are going to be most apropos for your board over here. Now, with all this being said, uh, we want to offer a couple of things here to you. Uh, so if you are interested in this project, we're more than happy to provide it to you. Okay? So just contact us, and we'll give you this entire project, and you can take a look at how we've set this up and kind of some of the methods of our madness over here. If uh, you're not interested in the project, but you'd still like to get kind of a list or a little bit more information, we've also posted that here as well. So I'm going to jump over here uh, to nine dot connects and just give you kind of a brief overview of what we got over here on our website for your information. Okay, obviously we provide all of the things like our training and our designing services and the products that we represent. But over here we also provide knowledge and we're always trying to add these add things in there. Obviously the videos like our webinar series are those things that we conjure up on the side because we think they're important. We list them over here as well. We also have a little interesting area that we've had some fun with. Uh, it's called the back nine. Okay? And what the back nine is all those kind of neat things that we provide that just don't really fit into any of our other categories over here. But under one of them, which we call the Axe Files, um, kind of a little humorous name, uh, Axe is our ex um, Altium ex employees. A number of us used to work at Altium, so we kind of jokingly call that here. But these have to relate to, I'll say, not just Altium, but even EDA tools themselves. So even if you're saying, well, I'm not going to use a vault because I don't use Altium Designer, the concept of a vault also applies to a PLM too. So if you've ever been kind of curious as to what a PLM might provide you, you may want to take a look at this because there's always these questions about what is the methodology behind something like a PLM or a vault. Uh, also, even auto routing. Even if you're not doing an Altium auto routing, you can see why Altium has been hesitant about putting together um, a full-on auto router, for example. And a lot of other EDA tools have followed suit in that reason and the reasoning as well. But the one I wanted to show you is how to tame your mechanical layers. It's one we just added up. This has been an interesting webinar because Normally, I do the webinar first, and then I do the follow-up verbiages afterwards, uh, like, for example, documentation or Q&A, which, and by the way, we'll do the Q&A one here in just a moment. But the idea behind this is that, actually, I wrote this part first and then did the webinar afterwards. So you can see um, all these things that, what I talked about, you can basically see that over here. So I talk about these things. I didn't talk about the colors um, all too much, but I, want, I just wanted to drive home that point. Uh, that originally I was doing different colors, and it's, this is crazy. I'm trying to make all these colors up, and it's really hard to do. Whereas what I did was that for the bottom colors, I kept with the orange, and for the top, I kept with the blue. And when you lay, and when you do the grouping anyways, it's easy enough to determine which one's which. So that's what I went with on that. Um, layer names, their colors, then the layer details, what was our rationale behind using these particular layers here, and then also what our groupings were. So what were we calling the notes page? What consisted of the notes pages or the stack details and so on and so forth? So we've got that on our website as well. But if you do want the PDF, we can make that available to you as well. So there you go. There's this kind of a introductory concept of these mechanical layers. They said it's not too hard. It just requires a bit of effort in order to, um, it just requires kind of a bit of effort to set all these things up. And it's much better to set these up before the project and to go through it mid-project, as I have found out the hard way. So there we go with that. Thank you very much for your time, and we hope that you enjoyed this particular session. Folks, I'm not sure why you showed up today, but we here at 9.connects know that topics of this nature are important to you. We know they're important for designing the PCB, especially as speeds are increasing, signal integrity issues are becoming more and more prevalent, and the demand for wireless is growing bigger and bigger each day. At 9.connects, this is the knowledge that we sell, and we sell it in different ways. Most of you know that we sell this knowledge in the form of trainings and coachings, especially with Altium Designer, and most recently with our new PCB Fundamentals class. We're also happy to announce that we have just released two one-day classes for Altium Designer libraries and schematics. In addition to coaching and training, we consult, and this word is really abused because anyone can call themselves consultants. So what do we mean by it? It means that if you have any challenges or issues with your PCB design, we can assist you. You have a board that will be handling large amounts of power, we can assist. Have boards that need compliance testing or designed to be compliant to a standard, we can assist. In short, we can assist you in achieving your design. And by the way, 
were more than happy to assist in board layout as well. When I was doing design, we had challenges which we call technological hurdles, and I'm sure you deal with them all the time. And in some cases, you may be avoiding features like wireless or gigahertz speed devices because this stuff may seem like major technological hurdles to overcome. But you don't have to wing it or go at it alone or even avoid it. Let us here at 9.connects get you over those technological hurdles. So for more information, contact us and check us out on the web at 9.connects.com. Thank you very much for taking a look at this video and you have a wonderful day.